Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Good. Well, today I'm going to be talking uh, specifically about uh, emotional expression and about the skin. Um, Friday's Guardian referred to the trial of Amanda Knox in Italy, and uh, Ian Leslie uh, was talking about the ways that uh, people would uh, interpret her expressions as being indicative of innocence or guilt, talking about the swivel of her hip or her, quote, icy blue eyes. And Ian Leslie says, the eyes, it is said, are windows to the soul. They are not. They are organs for converting light into electromagnetic impulses. But this has never stopped us dreaming of them that way. Well, these assumptions about the meanings of expression, of course, are very, very old ones. But today I'd like to talk about how a debate about reading expression became central to 19th century questions of anatomy, physiology, evolution, and even metaphysics. So let me set the stage a bit. In the 18th century, as as you all know, uh, the rise of modern anatomy coincided with, uh, sorry, (laughs) coincided with the development of Enlightenment philosophical beliefs about about the nature of the soul, the nature of the mind, its relation to the body. Um, And these coincided with debates that also had far-reaching political implications Uh, In France, for example, the French Revolution was very much associated with materialist philosophy and with the new anatomy. Um, And so science was very much at the heart of these debates. It was used to make claims uh, that were political and, uh, in France, anti-royalist and anti-religious. In Scotland, uh, as you probably know, those debates took a much uh, gentler tone than in France. But at the core of any question regarding the body in this period was this relation of the body to the mind and the soul. And the continuity of knowledge between what we now think of as very distinct disciplines um, was assumed. And an anatomist who advanced a new argument uh, about the senses knew that he perforce was advancing arguments that had theological consequences. Uh, Charles Bell is someone I suspect you all know, um, someone who was, uh, finished his life at, began and finished his professional life at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and he came to my attention initially as someone who Darwin was very much engaged with in his uh, work on the expression of emotion in man and animals. Um, Bell, as you probably all already know, was a native son of Edinburgh, a surgeon famed for his discoveries about the nervous system. As an artist, but more importantly as a lover of the arts, and also as an impecunious surgeon trying to establish himself as a lecturer in London, uh, he published a book directed at artists setting out to show them the muscular structure and physiology related to emotional expression. This was in 1806. It was entitled The Essays on the Expression, uh, sorry, on the Anatomy of Expression in Painting. It was a huge success, it was widely admired, read by the royal family, um, and adopted by generations of artists including the Pre-Raphaelites, and Lucy Hartley has uh, written extensively about that. As was to be expected in the historical context of the time, the book did not merely describe emotional expressions, but theorized their purpose, commenting on their supposed universality among all human beings, and discussed the origins of emotional expression. Bell was a religious man, he was an Episcopalian, he was influenced by the kinds of common sense philosophy that were, those ideas that were flying around Edinburgh at the time. And so, as a neurologist, he was embroiled in discussions of the location of the self. The physical location of the soul, spirit, or mind um, had long bedeviled philosophers. Aristotle split it from the sensorium, which he tucked away in the middle of the spine and thought that maybe the soul was in the heart. Descartes put it in the pineal gland, tucked it away in the center of the brain. But Bell founded his theory of the mind in the body and extended it throughout the nervous system, positing that the muscular structure of the body not only expressed the emotions of the self, but enabled them. That is, we are able to have the emotions that we have because of the physiology that we have. Um, And this was kind of a hot potato (laughs) uh, at the time. It was uh, pretty close to what people thought of as the materialist philosophy coming out of France. So Bell argued that God had designed for humans the body they had precisely in order that all humans would have a common experience. 
human emotion was universally legible to other humans because of the physical sympathy experienced by an observer with the expression of the observed. That is, okay, so this is very much the idea of sympathy you see in 18th century philosophy. You look at me and I see that you're in pain and because I would make the same expression if I were in pain, I can intuit what you're feeling, okay? So if you've read Adam Smith, Theory of Moral Sentiments, you know that that's, it's kind of foundational for moral philosophy in the period. So the specific embodiment of the mind was part of divine design, and, and that is the term that is used in this period. The senses did not obscure reality. They enable us to perceive it fully and meaningfully. So Bell believed that humans were divinely gifted, and we might think cursed, with the necessity of involuntarily expressing inner truth through our expressions. But this materialist analysis is carefully framed in this natural theological context. He attributes emotions to the higher intellectual faculties that the creator has implanted within all human beings by which we are drawn to him. So our emotions <coughs> lead us closer to God. And this would continue to be used as an explanation for involuntary expressions of the human face for many authors throughout the century, one with which Darwin disagreed but was compelled to address. Moreover, and more importantly, Bell not only believed that the more complex emotional expressions were unique to humans, but that the musculature of the space actually enabled humans not only to express but to experience these emotions in the first place. These muscles were given to express a uniquely human consciousness. They also made that consciousness possible. He backed up his assertions with detailed analyses of animals' muscular structure. He argued that only humans have the muscle to express, express a full range of complex emotions. He stated that we shared some emotions, what he called the passions, rage and fear, for example, with animals, but that higher order emotions such as reverence or remorse are specifically human. He went to considerable lengths to show where the similarities and differences between animals and humans ended and began and concluded that man is structurally an animal between the graminivorous and the carnivorous, showing muscular features of each in greater or lesser proportion depending on the individual. So a good example of Bell's ideas is his observation that the feeling of reverence is instinctively accompanied by uplifted eyes. The eye indicates the holier emotions, he says. Um, and, you know, and of course these claims uh, relied on the notion of a universal humanity. So his argument that was it didn't matter what culture you went to, you know, everyone had the same kind of instinctive uh, expression of emotions. And Darwin obviously found this aspect of Bell's analysis tendentious. Darwin responds dryly that the movement is probably a conventional one, the result of the common belief that heaven, the source of divine power to which we pray, is seated above us. Others were somewhat less respectful, uh, such as the radical Lancet editor Thomas Wakeley. Um, Bell provides, I'm not even going to try to read this because I, I know I can't get the accents right, but I just think it's a great quote. <laughs> um, Bell provided a scaffolding for Darwin in part by analyzing the structural relationship between facial muscles of different animals and humans. Um, and uh, Bell early on describes, uh, explains that uh, Mrs. Siddons' face has more in common with horses than with carnivores. And history is not, so far as I know, recorded her response to this particular compliment, although he was a huge fan. I mean, he meant well. Um, he also has liberal recourse to Shakespeare, Dante, and Homer. It's very curious. He uses so many examples from the stage to make his argument that emotions are authentic expressions of, of feeling. Um, but his examples are often people who are, of course, counterfeiting those emotions on stage. Um, if emotional expressions were to be an index of inner truth, the immediate problem, of course, is that humans lie. <laughs> uh, it is, after all, possible to smile when you're unhappy and even easier to scowl when you're not genu genuinely upset. Um, and, of course, as Bell did love the theater, he was very familiar with this kind of counterfeiting of emotions. Um, within the range of emotional expression, then, special significance attended those considered involuntary. These were considered more truthful. Uh, whereas the muscles of the face could generally be consciously controlled, the pallor of fear and the rubor of shame were privileged signs of inner truth. So we're moving on to blushing. Um, Bell argued that blushing was the result of the heart's response to emotion. And for him, this really strengthened the argument 
uh, for design. Um, because it's, it's not something that is a, a full physiological response. It's something that's really within the human, supposedly, human physiology of expression, not, not within the circulatory system. So characteristically, this focus on surface uh, leads to thoughts of racial difference. And uh, he says, well, we can perceive an advantage possessed by the fair family of mankind, which must be lost to the dark, for I can hardly believe that a blush may be seen in the Negro. And this is a very, very hot topic throughout the 19th century, is this issue of race and color of skin and um, you know, how, how you can read someone who has a darker skin. Um, however, and this is very important, he does believe that blushes take place in dark-skinned persons because this is a universal human trait. So he cites what will be a significant and highly debated piece of anecdotal evidence used throughout the century, that of a dark woman of African descent with a white scar on her face that supposedly shows the action of the blush. And this poor woman, because uh, she was the topic of many conversations, scientific uh, interest, uh, people would send uh, queries and ask them to provoke her to blush. So people who, who were the subjects of these kinds of, uh, of experiments were often uh, being treated in very strange ways to try to evoke the blush response so that, they could, so that it could be measured um, whether they had it or not. Um, so finally, blushing offers aesthetic pleasure. And uh, Bell, this is, this is a sort of favorite quote because he's usually such a soft-spoken um, character, he says, nothing is more hateful than a dog face that exhibits no token of sensibility in the variations of color. It's a very categoric statement for Bell. He's usually very moderate. The problem with this theory now <laughs> is that all color change may not be as equal in motive as it is in appearance. So a great deal of thought and care were given to signs of rubor that were not blushes. Meaning was not necessarily transparent. Even the blusher might be reduced to reading the tea leaves of her own complexion anxiously to divine their meaning. So the first problem was to define the blush. Not all rubor was created equal. Some instances are not blushes, they are flushes. And these are very, very distinct uh, terms. And it's actually quite important when you, when you run up against them in the literature because they, they, they're used to signal very different processes. Thomas Burgess, who corresponded with Darwin, wrote of an important book on the blush in 1839 called The Blush um, that follows Bell's ideas fairly closely. And he describes the blush's pro progress. And, you know, and he, he waxes poetic about it. He says how beautiful it is, how interesting, how we're charmed by it. But it sounds ghastly. It sounds like something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. <laughs> you, know, you have a, an oppression in the region of the stomach or the center of sympathies and the semilunar ganglia, the breathing is affected, a stifling follows. I mean, you know, no one would want to, uh, to have this happen to them. And in fact, repeatedly writers on the blush say, no one would blush if they could help it because it's, it's so awful. Um, Burgess gushes, blushing is the poetry of the soul and it uses the works of several poets from the ancients forward to substantiate his claim, asking, what picture can be more interesting than the virgin cheek in the act of blushing, the eloquent blood sympathizing with every mental emotion, rising and spreading over the cheek? But he also sta states flatly that, quote, no individual blushes of his own free will. And you can see why. Um, it did require a certain kind of consciousness to blush. And that was not necessarily consciousness of a stimulus, why does Harry's gaze make me blush? But consciousness of the body and the self, which is not identical. That is, consciousness of the body as an object, both for the self and the other. And what I mean by that is the consciousness of being looked at and being evaluated, both by another person, but also kind of watching yourself for your own reactions. The inability to blush thus conversely indicated the lack of a sense of one person's, as an object, of one's person, sorry, as an object of consciousness. It indicated a, quote, lack of affective capacity. The person could not sympathize with others or feel shame before the gaze of another. There's a good deal of disagreements, and, and these mirror the kinds of disagreements about race, about whether idiots or savages could blush, and these are the terms that they're using, um, seeing that they supposedly lacked this self-consciousness. And the disagreements really line up along the axis of whether the writer believes that moral feelings are innate and God-given, in which case the whole human family has it, or whether they are the fruit of evolution and civilized consciousness, 
Although Darwin is sort of an interesting limit case of this because he also believes that they are uniquely human, but he believes they're shared by all humans. So we'll see more of that later. But in all cases, the inability to blush indicated a lack of what Adam Smith saw in the 18th century as fundamental to moral relations, that is, the ability to see oneself from another person's perspective. And a corresponding you know, inability to judge oneself, to judge one's own actions. So a young woman's blush was a sign of emotional and sexual awakening. However, somewhat paradoxically, it was also a sign of her purity. By the mid-19th century, this reading accords well with the neuroscience of the day that posited that an overstimulated nerve would cease to respond to stimulus. The corrupt or sexually experienced consciousness and its body would cease to produce the blush. The man of the world never blushes. This is a very common saying. This ambiguity created a potential crisis of legibility. John, who never blushed, is chaste, though rarely civil, while blushing Bill's queer tricks would shame the devil, uses Ebenezer Elliot. Women's blushes, blushes can be as signs of in innocence or experience or confusingly both. Keats, in Sharing Eve's Apple, rings the changes on this theme. Oh, blush not so. Oh, blush not so, or I shall think you knowing. And if you smile the blushing while, then maidenheads are going. So blushes can signify many emotions. There's a blush for won't, and a blush for shan't, and a blush for having done it. There's a blush for thought, and a blush for not, and a blush for just begun it. And sometimes there's no blush at all, but just a flush, which could uh, you know, require dissection, both moral and physically, to, physical to properly identify. This is a famous scene in Pride and Prejudice. Elizabeth sees Darcy and Wickham face each other, and they both change color. What does it mean? Impossible not to long to know. Well, Wickham prejudices her in his favor by flattering her and telling his side of the story first. So she assumes that Darcy turns white with fear, and Wickham is flushed with righteous anger. But in fact, <laughs> as we discover later, Darcy's is the pallor of righteous anger, and Wickham's the rubor of shame. And she can't realize that until she reads Darcy's letter. So you sometimes have to have an ancillary text to understand what the blush is trying to tell you. Um, and you, know, you have another example here. You know, you've got to look for those clouded looks to see that you know, this is the blush of innocence versus the blush of experience. So you have to be a careful reader. Now Burgess's was the most significant 19th century book entirely on the blush. Continuing the argument that expression, and very, very specifically the blush, was evidence of design by a creator. He saw the blush as evidence of the mind-body connection of ensouled materiality. When an individual is about to blush, he says, the whole heart and soul and sense in concert move, transmitting the sensorial impulse from one to the other, and as it were, propel the blood by their combination of actions until it appears in the cheek. The observer is implicated as well through sympathy in this material manifestation of the inner life. When we see someone blush, we are, we're drawn to them. We know not why, although Burgess will tell us why. Um, now that said, poor Burgess, you know, who is you know, not really wanting to get deeply involved in the metaphysics of this, and, and by 39 he can dodge it a little more than, than Bell could have, but also Bell wasn't interested in dodging it. Um, he says, well, you know, the blush is all about transparently, tr transparency, but it's also a spiritual manifestation, so it's really beyond our understanding. He says, uh, you know, he doesn't want to fathom an abyss that knows no limits. This is about the soul. I'm not going to talk about this. This is in the introduction to a book that goes on for several hundred pages. Um, so it seems a little odd. <laughs> but it seems that what Burgess means is that he's going to limit himself to the physically observable. This, of course, does not actually work for him. Um, because he ends up concluding that this is evidence of design. If we reflect on the variety of changes and actions that must take place in our moral and physical constitution before either the blush of shame or the pallor of fear can be represented in the human face, we must clearly see that such adaptation and harmony of arrangement is palpable evidence of design, he says. Um, he also believes that this creator instilled the blush um, as a way of keeping us honest. Um, that the soul might have sovereign power of displaying in the cheek the various internal emotions of the moral feelings. Well, so this seems straightforward enough. This seems like we're back on, on Bell's turf. Um, but blushing is never that simple, as we know. This divine provision, like all our fallen nature, is, is liable to go awry. 
Burgess blames it on over-civilization. I think it's sort of a great anticipation of Freud. Um, he says, well, you know, civilization has screwed up the blush like it screwed up everything else that the creator gave us. Um, and he anticipates Freud in seeing this as a kind of tax. He, and he uses the word a tax on the civilized state. Um, you know, the more civilization you get, the more sort of over-refined you are, the more uh, the blush is liable to be kind of, to, to begin to signify other things. Um, and this is quite interesting because this is a, a lot of the same rhetoric that turns up later in the century around, um, around decadence, right? Um, is that over-civilization weakens the organism, weakens the material organism. So the blush is God's provision to make human society possible, to provide a common sense of interpretation on which a social body may be built, but then we've messed it up. So, and, and what emerges from that is that we have the false blush, which is not a flush. <laughs> it's, a, it's a blush, but it's not a real blush. Um, and what is, where, where, where does this come from? Well, it has no other assignable cause than that of an extreme state of morbid sensibility over which reason and the moral powers seem to have no control whatever. For as I have already stated, no individual blushes of his own free will. And he says that a few times in this book. This morbidity is both physiological and psychological. It's induced at least in part by a kind of perverse self-regard. Briefly, the individual becomes so hyper-aware of his own face, and I'm using he now for a reason, um, that it short-circuits the process of having a genuine emotion. His patients are always watching themselves react until they begin to react to their own self-surveillance. So they're blushing for no reason. And the reason I, I switched from the feminine to the masculine pronoun is because when Burgess talks about how beautiful the blush is and how charming it is, he talks about women and very young men. Adult men, when they blush like this, it's pathological. Um, it's not good news. I mean, they come to him to be treated because they have this blushing problem. And apparently it's a huge problem. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the blushes of men are pathological if they're frequent. And Aristotle actually says this in the Ethics. Shame is not becoming to every age, but only to youth. An older person should not do anything that need cause this sense. And this sentiment survives pretty much unchanging into the 19th century. Bell observes, quote, blushing assorts well with youthful and effeminate features. And part of it is that the man's body is to, expected to understate the burden of public scrutiny. Burgess says, well, you know, if it hampers the individual in his commerce, then it's essentially pathological. He says, at the best, it is no very agreeable experience, and everyone, except perhaps the most accomplished coquette, would, I suppose, suppress a blush if it were possible to do so. He cites nine cases of intractable blushing problems, eight of whom are men, seven of whom have had to give up their career. Careers as various as soldier, prison warden, minister, medical student, chemist, musician, and draper. Only the tea taster has been able to continue in his profession. Although he, quote, lives in constant dread of appearing absurd. <laughs> I mean, actually, I mean, this is actually a real, a real problem. It is, it is a real pathology, and, you know, but it, it's, it's hard to read back at the distance you know, uh, of years and to, to, um, to have quite the same sympathy that, that Burgess has. So he provides an extended discussion of the physiology of the blush, which involves the involuntary or sympathetic nervous system. And here he seems to echo Bell. The other structures that are important are the minute blood vessels of the cheek. And he points out that, quote, the skin in man and the erectile tissues in the lower animals um, are involved in the blush. As we shall see hereafter, quote, this latter structure may be engaged in the human being during the act of blushing. And Freud would later describe the blush as a mild erection of the head. And uh, you'll see the, the, the connecting dot here is, is in Darwin, which you'll see uh, shortly. Darwin sees it as kind of uh, displaced to sexual selection um, that, results to the, uh, that results in the blush. The purpose of the sympathetic nerves is, for Burgess, to free the body from, quote, the fickleness of the will, a power of the mind so fickle and so varying that life would be in constant danger if we had it in our power to stop or suspend the exercise of functions with which life is essentially connected. This kind of interesting reversal of German romantic notions is the, of the, you know, the body is something that is distracting the will and undermining the will. Um, you know, here it's keeping, it's keeping us from killing ourselves. Um, blushing is not merely exclusively the property of humans, it is essentially moral. It speaks volumes, he says. We all instinctively know that its presence is the result of a painful struggle in the mental feelings. 
except when it's a flush. And it's a result of overeating, menopause, exertion, or annoyance. These are the, the causes he lists. So the anatomy of expression was particularly significant for Darwin's own expression of the emotions in Man and Animals, published in 1872. Darwin's book uses a good deal of Bell's work, and he praised Bell for, quote, having laid the foundations of the subject as a branch of science and providing, quote, a noble structure of research material. That said, he's determined to show that there are evolutionary reasons for expression having nothing to do with divine intention. Blushing must therefore be functional or vestigial of a past function. Darwin sent out queries throughout the world trying to determine the universality of the blush or lack thereof in other races, and thus a lot of correspondence around trying to get your kitchen maid to blush, even if it's hard to see if she's blushing. Um, he also, like his predecessors, works hard at distinguishing the flush and the blush, and the distinction, again, circles around self-consciousness. Um, so, you know, he, he, you know he, he kind of, he dissects the sort of limit case. You know, you might flush because of a disturbing remembrance, but then if it was about the way someone else saw you or evaluated you, then it would be sort of more of a blush than a flush. Um, so, although the deeper circulatory events may mimic the blush, the true blush is on the surface. It's just, just below the skin and the capillaries. That's, again, important both for Bell and Darwin. In this case, he follows Bell in seeing that the, you know, the true blush, because it can only reflect higher and specifically human emotions, cannot involve the full organism, cannot involve the full circulatory system. Um, so for Darwin, if the blush isn't functional from an evolutionary perspective, then it must be a side effect of self-consciousness, which is functional from an evolutionary perspective. And of course, that would be from a, the perspective of sexual selection. So he observes that the blush involves the surface of the body where the self's attention to and perception of the self is located. And he says, attention directed to any part of the body tends to interfere with the ordinary and tonic contraction of the small arteries of that part. These vessels, in consequence, become at such times more or less relaxed and are instantly filled with arterial blood. Through frequent self-attention to the face, we've evolved capillaries there that are much, much more susceptible of this relaxation. This is Darwin's theory. He considered blushing to be the most human and latest developed form of emotional expression and consequently discusses it in the penultimate chapter of his book, the last chapter being summary and conclusion. So it, it all builds up to the blush. Like Burgess, he attributes it to the power of self-attention. Um, but he does not think it possible that animals would have, quote, closely considered and been sensitive about personal appearance. So he decides that, quote, blushing originated at a very late period in the long line of our descent. And a reader might think that there's a little bit of begging the question going on here. <laughs> the question of whether animals are concerned with their own appearance. I mean, you know, given that appearance is very important for a lot of uh, sexual selection processes, but, but we'll let that go. <laughs> so Bell, Burgess, and Darwin all believe that the blush is essentially human, that it resulted from, as Darwin called it, self-attention that animals lacked. Monkeys, therefore, could flush from rage, but not blush from shame. Um, and Burgess doubts that people are able to blush when they're alone in the dark. Darwin felt that people could blush, even if they were charged with a crime of which they were innocent because they were thinking about how people would feel about them if they had committed the crime. Burgess would say that's a flush. And that it's the imputation of guilt that provokes the blush. Darwin observes that the recollection of a crime committed in solitude will not provoke a blush, but a detected fault will, depending on, quote, the feeling of regard for those who have detected, witnessed, or suspected the fault. Darwin also observed that blushing in solitude was frequent, but always related to, quote, the thoughts of others about us. And of course, he's constantly receiving notes from all over the world detailing whether people have blushed in, in solitude. <laughs> people must have been sitting with their mirrors. <laughs> um, Darwin noted that the congenitally blind often blush he observes that the blind at a, this particular asylum for children are not aware they're observed, and it's a most important part of their training to impress that knowledge on their minds. And that is what strengthens the tendency to blush by, quote, increasing the habit of self-attention. Burgess believed that people of color could blush as their, quote, inferiority was intellectual rather than moral, but he flatly states that, quote, the idiot cannot blush. The primum mobile of action, that is conscience, is dormant in this being. From these and similar facts, it is but reasonable to infer that the seed of the impulse which excites the true blush is higher up in the nervous system than that of the passions. In other words, this impulse emanates wholly from the cerebrum. 
Um, and as we've said, the idiot as the person of color was the kind of limit case for, um, for what people were thinking of as you know, the human. Um, Darwin wanted to see the blush as universally human, so he writes in his letters that he's really pleased to find that Vogt's microcephalous idiot was not utterly degraded as he was capable of, quote, a real blush caused by an examination of his naked body. Um, this is an 1871 letter. Typically, more benevolent interpretations of the continuity between the human races gives way at mid-century to interest in parsing differences and locating them in the body as biological evolutionary theories projected onto the development of cultures and societies. This discussion was related to discussions of savagery and civilization, race and empire. Darwin sent these questionnaires all over the world, largely to other scientists, but also missionaries. Um, and so uh, in some cases, the research to respond was quite strenuous. Uh, so Italian physiologist Angelo Masso uh, you know, uh, believed that animals could and did blush as a result of emotion, which did not require self-consciousness. And he studied the mechanism of blushing with a, you know, with a, uh, uh, an electrical meter that he developed. Um, so in order to study this, he put this um, meter on to this 10-year-old boy and restrained him and then said really unpleasant things to him. <laughs> Darwin remarks, it's difficult to prove that our children instinctively recognize any expressions, but valiantly tried with his own firstborn. Fortunately, the paternal seems to have won out over the scientist. He says, when the child was about four months old, I made in his presence many odd noises and tried to look savage. But the noises, if not too loud, as well as the grimaces, were all taken as good jokes. I attributed this at the time to their being preceded or accompanied by smiles. That would do it. <laughs> Thus, though to be a grown man afflicted with frequent blushing was to be pathologically oversensitive, it might be worse to be unable to blush at all. Uh, Cesare Lombroso believed that uh, criminals did not blush. You, uh, Lombroso was a very important criminologist at the end of the century, uh, corresponded a good deal with Francis Galton, and that the lack of an ability to blush was a sign of predisposition toward criminality and atavism. He believed that the lack of ability to blush properly was both moral and physical. He found that vasomotor reactions provoked by amyl nitrate were significantly delayed in the criminal population. And he said that although excitement might produce a flush in those criminals, the blush of true shame was generally absent. And the way he tried to evoke this blush was to um, you know, talk about something inconsequential and then suddenly turn and stare at the criminal or to harangue them about you know, their, their crime in, in moral terms. So, I mean, these, these Sicilian or, or, or <laughs> Lombardian criminals must have, you know, you just imagine the conversations when they went back to their bunks, you know, with the other, with the other people. It's like, yeah, I saw the doctor, I don't know, he's crazy. <laughs> so, so anyway, all of this to say that in the 19th century conversation on something is apparently frivolous as blushing, we can trace conflicts, theological, evolutionary and physiological. <clears throat> so as we began with a current example to show the stakes of our desire to read faces, I will leave you with a lighter comment from the end of the 19th century uh, by Max Beerbohm, uh, who said, you know, really, we need to stop trying to read faces and it's an expression of the soul. And the wonderful thing is and we bring, when we bring makeup back, we'll stop worrying about whether people are blushing. We can just admire the beauty of the face. So. Uh, I will leave you uh, with that thought. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.